Good evening. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Northern Kentucky History Hour. I'm Sean Mendel, the Assistant Director at Barringer Crawford Museum, and it's my pleasure to be your host tonight. The Northern Kentucky History Hour is a project of Barringer Crawford Museum, Northern Kentucky's History Museum. I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. The Barringer Crawford Museum is supported in part by the City of Covington, Kenton County Court, Arts Wave, Kentucky Arts Council, Northern Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame, the Carol Ann and Ralph V. Hale Jr. Foundation, Kentucky Humanities, and our members. If you're not a member of the museum, please consider joining, or if you'd like to learn more about volunteer opportunities at BCM, you can find out more at bcmuseum.org. Before we begin, um, I'd like to let you know if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll try to answer them as we go along. Also tonight, there's a trivia question. The first person to enter the correct answer in the chat wins Northern Kentucky History Hours prize for the night and bragging rights. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Travis Brown. Travis is retired from the Fort Thomas Police, Fort Mitchell Police Department in 2014 after serving 27 years as a police officer. During his tenure, he served with the Kentucky State Police, Fort Wright Police, Boone County Sheriff, and Kenton County Sheriff. He completed his undergraduate studies at the University of Louisville, earning a Bachelor of Arts degree in police administration, and he earned a Master's of Public Administration at Northern Kentucky University. As an adjunct professor at Xavier University's School of Criminal Justice, he teaches police management and government nonprofit budget. He currently serves as the executive board member of the Kenton County Historical Society. Travis, I'd like to welcome you to our program. If you're ready, I'll pass the controls over to you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. I got a little presentation I made here and bear with me while I share it with you. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we're all seeing it. Yep, I can see it. See you. Okay. I want to go back to the beginning. Oh. Let's start on page one, shall we? Okay. I want to talk about why I picked this subject. Um, while I was a police officer in Fort Wright and Fort Mitchell, I had a side job, and that was... Uh, I rode a motorcycle during funeral escorts. You've probably seen these guys blocking traffic. Well, that was me. So during that time, I got to meet pretty much every funeral director in three states, uh, Cincinnati area, definitely all the ones in Northern Kentucky for sure. And uh, it was interesting to me that some of these ladies and gentlemen come from families that have been in this business for well over a hundred and sometimes a lot longer than that years, some up to 140 years. And their names still are on the funeral homes you see today. And so that started this. And then I thought, you know, I saw hundreds and hundreds of people who came to funerals and sad, and it was a grieving process, but it, it's not all a bad thing. And so I started researching how long is this how long have humans been grieving over the deceased? Well, it turns out as long as humans have been on the planet. So the, uh, even there's evidence from Neanderthal times that they grieved their recent dead. The first uh, attempts at preserving the recent dead for viewing and other rituals comes from the Egyptians, and we are, we're all familiar with mummies and the mummification process. And they actually started doing some embalming, actually. And they use uh, certain salts and removing the interior organs, and they dried and wrapped skin for preservation. And they were quite successful, as we know. Uh, in Europe, the Romans actually would preserve bodies by immersing them in alcohol, and then inserting other herbs 
into incisions that they made in the flesh. And then they uh, wrapped up the body in tar and wax sheets for preservation. In the United States, this really took off during the Civil War. As we know, uh, our young men left far away from home, but when they were killed in battle, their families really wanted them to come home for grieving and funerals. So that's when Dr. Thomas Holmes developed an arsenic-based embalming fluid. And that really helped slow the bacteria that formed and caused decomposition of the bodies. In fact, uh, this process was used to preserve President Abraham Lincoln after his assassination. And he spent 20 days on a train heading back to Springfield on a tour. And he was effectively preserved for the entire trip. During the Civil War, our uh, <clears throat> Kentucky's general, John Hunt Morgan, as we know, he, he successfully got up into our area, was repulsed and beat at the Battle of Cynthiana, but then came back after being captured, escaped and came through Boone County, uh, and then made his way back to the South where he was eventually killed in Tennessee. In April of 18 or September 4th, 1864. But what happened to him after that uh, is the subject of the next article I'm writing for the Historical Society paper. And Morgan, after he was killed, was first transported to Abington, Virginia, where he was interred for four days. Four days after that, he went to Richmond, Virginia, where he was put into a vault. And he remained there until April of 1868. And his family finally had the means to bring him to Lexington for burial. But on the way by rail, he stopped in Cincinnati where he was to catch the last leg of the trip. And in Covington, his body was removed from the train and transported to a house in downtown Covington for uh, one last celebration of his life. Now, there's at least one source I had that somebody tried to open the coffin, but that was very unpleasant and they closed it immediately. And then the next day he was sent all the way to Lexington where he is in Lexington Cemetery to this day. But prior to the late 1800s, this is 1880s, 1890s, there were no funeral homes. Uh, they were starting to develop. But before that, you had people in a business called undertaking. They called themselves undertakers. But none of them were professionally trained by anybody to hold funeral services. Normally, these folks built cabinets or had library stables and they had uh, coaches. And then they made the funeral arrangements. And normally that would have been in a house and uh, these folks would stage the body if you wanted a viewing and they would ice the body down. And that was how you preserved the body until you, you know, it finally interred the body. So by 1834, you started seeing listings in the local directories in Cincinnati for an undertaker, not a cabinet maker, not a library guy, but an actual undertaker became a business. And the first one I could find was in uh, 1834. But in 1836, Lippincott says that he makes coffins and he's ready at any hour to give personal attendance at funerals. All funeral appendages furnished if required also any number of horses and carriages at short notice. So this is the first guy I could find in Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky, who says, I can handle your whole funeral process, no problem. I have horses, I have coffins and everything else. So the first one I found in Covington was VT Perkins and that was in 1847. And he had a business at the, at the corner of 6th and Madison and uh, he too, had coffins ready-made, every size quality. 
he kept a couple of horses and a hearse and he was ready to, to take care of business at any hour. And he advertised this in the Licking Register newspaper. Abraham Rose, uh, you may be familiar with the Rose name to this day. And uh, they're, they got their start from a man named Abraham Rose. And in 1833, Abraham made cabinets. And he had a shop on Scott Street, 45th Street. Apparently business was getting better. And by 1860, he moved his business to Madison between 4th and 5th. Thomas Reed was the next guy I found. Uh, by 1856, he's advertising and he had a small shop. Uh, if you're familiar with the market space between Scott and Market Streets in Covington, that is now Park Place. And that was an open air market in this time, much as it is today with the food market court in that area. It was an open market with all kinds of shops in that area. But in 1861, he moved his business on Madison as well between 5th and 6th. So if you were in the uh, need for a funeral undertaker, then you went down Madison. The number of undertakers started really growing uh, by the 1860s. So you had Rose, Reed, and then another name that pops up and stays in the advertising for quite some time is William Willen. And he had a stable, so he had more horses and buggies and an undertaking business on 6th Street opposite of Washington. Uh, William Estep also a furniture maker, but he started building uh, coffins also. And his shop was on the Lexington Pike between Madison and Washington. So these guys are all pretty much within a few blocks of each other back then. Estep uh, got a partner named John Ewing and uh, they moved their business right over to 529 Madison. Charles Donnelly uh, claimed to be the, the biggest of all of the funeral directors in this era. And uh, he built a building which is still standing. And at the end of this, I'm going to show you some of the then and now photos of the funeral homes from back then. But Donnelly had what I believe was the biggest one. And he uh, convinced the local media to print up a real nice full page article uh, and he, he's a guy who came from Ontario, moved to Covington, and uh, he had his starts in, in Hemingway's Glass Works, which was down in that area as well. But then he had found a partner, and he took up undertaking. He uh, built the building that's still standing today at 809, and it has two front doors, 809 and 811 Madison. And he kept his horses his buggies, his coffins, and 75 tons of hay inside of this building. And if you look at it, yeah, he probably did several stories and it, and it extends down a block. And that's a picture of it now. All right, in 1872, some of the names that we see still to this day, Middendorf and Lubers. And they opened up their undertaking business at 82 Pike Street. Now we are starting to get a little more technologically advanced. And some people are starting to learn how to do embalming as well as undertaking. So in Cincinnati, we actually have some folks that advertise embalming for the first time, 1866. That's Jay Epley and Company. And a quote in the uh, business advertisement from that year was, we are also prepared to embalm bodies perfect, producing no discoloration, no obviating the use, no obligating the use of ice entirely. So no longer would you have to come get a bunch of ice and ice your loved one down in your living room. These guys could embalm them. Apparently uh, start showing their embalmed loved ones at their business instead of the home. So that's when we start to see funeral homes. Like I said, uh, embalming eliminated the need to ice down the bodies for viewing. But who was teaching folks how to embalm? Well, 
as it turns out, uh, Cincinnati was the place you wanted to come to learn how to embalm. And in the 1880s, it became a profession, embalming itself. And Joseph Clark, Dr. Joseph Clark, he learned his uh, embalming trade during the Civil War. And he brought his trade to Cincinnati and opened up a school of embalming, along with uh, Dr. C.M. Lukens in 1882. And he set up shop in Pulte's Medical College at the University of Cincinnati. And uh, that became a permanent part of General Hospital, which is now University Hospital by 1915. Someone could get a degree in embalming and later on funeral director. You could actually get your degree in that. And they still have the Mortuary Science College there today. So the professional approach, of course, comes across the river. And by 1884, Thomas Reed removed his title of undertaker and became a funeral director and embalmer. So apparently he learned his trade also. But uh, some of them didn't do it. Abraham Rose, for instance, remained an undertaker and then later also became a funeral director. Donnelly, however, was doing enough business that he could still just remain an undertaker, apparently. But no advertisement by Donnelly or Rose offered up embalming uh, as of 1884. By 1900, you can see that just in Covington alone, these are the businesses that were running undertaking. And by then, their funeral home did not have a separate listing everybody was put under undertakers still in the Covington business directory as of 1900. And this is the first time we see Gus Menninger's and Gus Menninger is by far one of the most interesting Coventonians that ever lived and we'll get into him now. Menninger uh, his father was a tinsmith, I believe, and he had a shop on Madison also. And manager clerked for him, but uh, he quickly moved out of that and then uh, got into undertaking. In 1890, he started working at one of the uh, Newport houses, the Gideon's funeral home. And uh, he set out on his own and he ran a funeral home under his name until 1907. Menninger also became a politician in Covington. And uh, he got himself elected as a city alderman, which Covington had aldermen and city councilmen back then. The aldermen had more power. They've changed that at uh, some point not long after this. And he convinced the uh, folks in Campbell County that he should be their tax collector although he lived in Covington. And uh, he opened up a union mutual benefit company. And what that was, was uh, funeral insurance. He opened up a company where you could pay him uh, a fee every month and you would be guaranteed a first class funeral upon death. And a lot of people bought into it. Uh, he got sued a few times over the quality of service, but was fairly successful in this business. One of Gus's greatest ideas, however, was to really cut down the cost of a funeral. And he had this idea to uh, hitch a trolley car to the line and uh, put the entire funeral on the rails. So he had this idea to put the... Uh, recently deceased, the coffin, the family, the pallbearers, and anybody else into uh, one big car and pull it along the trolley, line, like the Green Line or wherever else if you wanted to go to Highland or St. Mary or, or even into Campbell County, since the trolley ran all over, you could pull his funeral car along for the funeral. Uh, although it seems like it was a good idea, I don't believe it ever happened. I didn't see no evidence of it ever actually happened. But at some point, manager decides that he's going to get out of the funeral business and just stay as a tax collector. And I believe uh, his wife left him and he had 
recently found himself with one of uh, his friend's widows. And uh, they left his family, son and wife. They moved to California, never to be seen again here. And uh, he stayed behind and sold his interests in his funeral business to Allison and Yates. Remember the name Allison, it's still around. And uh, the price was over $30,000. But as part of the deal, manager said that he would no longer partake in undertaking business in Covington whatsoever. So he has a non-compete clause in 1907. Well, Gus stayed out of the business until September 1st, 1908, when much to everybody's surprise, his name now appears as Linneman and Moore's new undertaker and embalming specialist. And the uh, Linneman Moore funeral home is at 17, 717 Madison. And uh, Gus, you know, a real friend of the newspapers, promotes himself. Uh, manager will be the general manager having absolute control over the firm's business. He wishes to take this means of informing his friends, extending to all to call and inspect the most up-to-date undertaking established in three cities. Well, as we know, about a year earlier, he signed a non-complete. So Allison and Yates sued manager, of course. And uh, the, the lawsuit was heard in Kenton Circuit Court by Judge Haberson, uh, October 1st, 1908. And manager had one of the pricey attorneys in town, of course, Allison and Yates went after the other one, Mr. Rich. Uh, Maria Moore was the manager at Lineman and Moore's business at that time. And she wanted to take a leave of absence and hired manager temporarily to run the business in her absence. Uh, Judge Haberson wasn't buying it. He ruled for the enjoyment. In other words, manager had to quit the firm. Manager, of course, wouldn't be happy with that. So he petitioned the Court of Appeals to hear the case and did so for about two and a half years. And the appellate court finally heard the case and agreed with the ruling of the Kenton County Courts. And that ended manager's career in the funeral business for good. Then and now, all right, I have some drawings that were advertisements in the uh, newspapers of the time. And uh, they show the buildings. Now, the, not all of the addresses add up, but I did a little research and found the building still standing you're about to see. Gus Manager's Funeral Home. And that's at 66 and 68 Pike Street. And that address does not exist. That I was convinced that building was still there. And sure enough, it is. It is now 120 Pike Street. And I'm not sure who Mills and James are, but I don't know if they know that their office is in the first floor of a funeral home. Charles Donnelly's place. As you can see, it takes up a whole city block behind it. And it has a modest frontage there on Madison, but goes, extends quite a ways back. Well, it's still there. And it's got two, I believe right now, both of those uh, storefronts are empty right now. But if you look back, you can see along the side of that building where he would have had horses and hay and wood and and everything else that one needs to run a funeral home right out of this building at 809 Mass. Allison and Rose. And as we know, Allison and Rose is still quite alive and well on Madison and the place they moved in 1925. Abraham, the founder, he died in 1877, but his two sons continued the business. Their sister, Rose, Mary T.M. Swindler, that's another recognizable name from Swindler and Curran and Latonia and also Taylor Mill. And he uh, broke away from Allison Rose in 1914, and that's when Swindler's funeral home started, I believe, in the same place it's located today or very close to it. In 1925, the Rose family joined up with John Allison, and that formed the funeral business we know today as Allison and Rose. And in 1925, 
this is the advertisement they ran as a brand new funeral home at the corner of Madison and Robbins. And it looks pretty much the same today. 1021 Madison Avenue, there's not a lot has changed in this building. Some in the front, but I would bet, having been in there many times, that it resembles the way it would have looked probably around 1925. And this is where Lineman and Moore started off with the manager as their manager in 1907. And that is the building that's at 717 Madison today. And I believe that's the Northern Kentucky Community Action Commission building. And I'm not sure if they know who the previous occupants were then. Lineman, however, moved uh, his business, and this is the grandson. Bud Lineman, he moved out to Erlanger. And this mansion in Erlanger on uh, Commonwealth Avenue was uh, built by Colonel Hubbard Buckner. And when Bud bought this in 1955, it was in disrepair. And he restored it to the uh, state that it's in today. Quite beautiful, if you've ever been inside of it. That is all the slides I had. I think we're going to have some questions. Okay, we've got a couple of a uh, couple of interesting comments. Um, let me scroll back up here. So Paul Weisenberger says uh, William Middendorf was his was his second great grandfather. So he's on the call today. Very good. Yep, and uh, I got that right, Mister. <laughs> yeah. it, it, Feel free to put something in the chat if you need to. Um, and then uh, Joetta Prost says, I've, I've read that during the late 1800s, the bodies of recently deceased paupers and victims of violence were sometimes dug up and stolen with, with oh, the bodies yeah, yeah. used as cadavers for medical students in Cincinnati. In 1883, the value of a body for dissection was $30. Have you researched this or do you have any additional information? Actually, I do. Uh, my original articles appear in the Kenton County Historical Society newsletters, and I believe that was May, June of 2020, and the second one was on Gus Menninger by himself, and that would have been later that, that year. Those two were in 2020. You can access both of those on our website free. The entire issue, the articles are there, and in the uh, original article, I addressed just that that once the mortuary school opened up, all of a sudden uh, bodies started becoming, you know, fresh bodies would get dug up or taken from hospitals and mysteriously uh, may have ended up as student cadavers at the mortuary school. Coffins too. The manager himself was presented with uh, some really luxurious coffins by these thugs that tried to pedal them to him cheap and he he wasn't buying it but uh it turns out they had been stolen and they had at least one of them did have a have a freshly deceased person <laughs> yep, you're muted. Oh, okay i've got uh, another question for you is there a difference between a coffin and a casket i don't believe so i, I think they're interchangeable now at one time possibly a coffin, in my opinion, would be one more wooden. So they advertise coffin sales from the cabinet makers. So they would be the ones who built, it would be like a big wooden cabinet. And that's, now a casket would have been something that came along and they were made out of lead and iron and copper. And those I've seen referred to in literature as caskets. And they would have handles and be very uh, velvet lined and you could spend a lot of money on those that i believe that's the basic difference that could be you know that uh, coffins are what the folks made at the cabinet store casket was something that was very intricate okay thank you um if you have any other questions please put them in the chat or feel free to put them in the q and a i'm i'm monitoring both and i'll be happy to pass those along. I think that we have a um, we have a, a a trivia question, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Oh, I do. I have for wonderful prizes. All right, the question: 
Abraham Rhodes, one of Covington's earliest undertakers, advertised this as his trade in 1833. So whoever uh, is able to get their answer in the chat first wins our lovely prize. I'm not sure what that prize is, but uh, so Patrick says uh, a blacksmith. That is incorrect. Okay. Any other guesses? Oh, um, Blanche says cemetery bombs were an invention during the grave robbing days. They would be placed just underground so that if someone tried to disturb the grave, it would be detonated. Wow, that's really interesting. I've not heard that, but that would have been a good one. Yeah. Any other guesses? Okay. Wagon maker, cabinet maker. We have a winner. Cabinet maker it is. Cabinet All right. Maker. Paul Weisenberger. I'm um, glad to see that you you got got that one uh, since you you have this history uh, in your family. It's great. Awesome. Yeah. So, you know, thank Stephanie, you. For Stephanie Morgan says Undertaker here, um, but it was Cabinet Baker. Is that correct? Yeah. The four okay. Undertaker was a profession. Uh, most of them were cabinet makers, furniture makers, uh, library stable keepers, I don't remember seeing a blacksmith, but that certainly was possible. But it would have been, had, had it been somebody who could build you a coffin or carry them from place to place in a library. We got some more. Hey, we've got a few more questions here. Um, when did the practice of cremation begin in our area? Well, my research ends about 1911 and I didn't see any of it advertised before that so it would have been after after that and Linneman moved over to 11th street and I don't believe they were doing it uh Wilkie that I've not seen any cremation advertisements in the 1930s but I can't say that nobody was advertising those services okay uh, we've got another question. Um, didn't Linneman have a funeral home across the yes, street? Yes, they did. That's what I was just talking about. I, it was uh, it was on 11th, and it would have been at that. It's no longer there. It's not standing. I have a picture of it. I okay, might be able to give side. you the address. This is actually my original article right here. Uh, that's Menninger. I thought I would keep these out just in case I got a question I needed to look <laughs> up. Uh, okay. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, Linneman and Moore moved to 31 East 11th in 1909. And so that would have been by the Latin school. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, John asks, when did law require concrete encasement of coffins? I can't swear it does now. I've, unfortunately, I've seen funerals and been to them where that wasn't the case. You're talking about a vaulted one? That, I'm not sure that's a law. I can't say for sure. However, I have been to places where they do not require. I believe that might be the cemetery's requirement. Okay. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think that's the law. Okay. Um, and one more question. What is the definition of awake? Well, that's interesting. I when I was very little, I attended my grandfather's wake. Coming from an Irish family, that uh, it was alarming, but they had my deceased grandfather uh, in, his, in his coffin, in his house. And they, uh, you know, sipping whiskey and singing and whatnot. That was what I considered awake. You stayed there to make sure he didn't wake up for a day and that's when they iced the bodies down that's really what was going on they kept the body on ice till they were quite sure they were dead that's it's really interesting uh, is green burial legal in kentucky uh no embalming simple burial in a pine box that sort of thing to the best of my knowledge it is i don't believe that's a requirement 
In fact, I know it's not because I've, I've seen it done. And I've seen cardboard caskets. Uh, you know, we're talking real cheap that these folks actually bought this thing in a garage sale. It was a casket. It was made out of cardboard. And they had to seal this thing up because there was no one born. Wow. It's really interesting. I think it's unusual, but illegal. I don't think it is, but I could be wrong. Okay, any other questions? Oh, I think one just came through. Um, oh, Leslie. Yeah. Yeah, we know Leslie's house was, uh, was definitely a funeral home. Oh, and, and, uh, and they're saying that Heritage Acres in Cincinnati is a green burial location. That's good to know. Yeah, there's another one I've been to up there. And it's off, not Banning, it's up around Wyoming. Yeah, scary. I've also seen one in Erlanger, but not, it was at, it's a very old mm -hmm. cemetery that's in the back of a subdivision. Wow. And it uh, looks like someone says, yeah, I believe that. Yeah. Spring, I, I, one. yeah. Leslie, I don't remember the name of yours right offhand. Let me see if I have it. I've looked that up before. I might have it here. What's the address? It's on Scott Street, isn't it? Leslie and I used to work together. Yep, 1636 Scott. Yeah, let's see what I have here. And, and while you're looking, uh, we have another question. Do you have any pictures of open caskets in survivors' living rooms? I didn't include any in the article. Did you say survivors? That's Is that what the question? Yeah, that's what the question said. I mean, I'm guessing that means, you know, family members, whoever's okay. uh, just lost the person. Uh, well, yeah, they're in the newspaper. I didn't, and uh, unfortunately, quite often they're children. And you see a lot of flowers and children in small caskets. I didn't see the need to add those to this article. Leslie, uh, your funeral home was L.L. Wilkie. Undertaker, library, boarding, and sales stable, 1534, 1536 Scott Street. And the gentleman lived at 1557 Greenham, if you own that house too. Paul says, my mother told me her uncle was shown uh, in the family home in 1926 in Newport. Right. I, this was 1975 when I went to one. Uh, I'll tell you what I have seen also, and that was real unusual. It was in Campbell County and I was, I had to, when I call ride the funeral where I would escort the procession from the funeral home to the cemetery and it was gypsies. And they rented out the funeral home for five days and had to wake all five days, open cask the whole time. Wow. Before we took them, yeah. It's interesting. Uh, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so we've got a couple more questions. Are there any known slave cemeteries in Kenton County? Yeah, certainly. And that would be, uh, I don't know the official name of the cemetery. There's a slang name that I'm not going to repeat, but it is an all-Black cemetery in Irvine. And it is in the back of a subdivision off of Garvey. Yeah, it might be called Mary Queen of Heaven officially. But uh, if anybody knows about that, it's off Garvey Avenue, one of the side streets, and you actually literally go between two houses, and there's a, a small gravel road that leads back to the cemetery, and that, that was a slave cemetery. The other one I can tell you about is Burlington Cemetery, the old one, not the one that's on 18, that is off Idlewild. If you look to the left, when you pass the courthouse, there was an old overgrown cemetery. That is a slave cemetery, partially. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have one more question. What was the name of the funeral home on 6th Street next to the firehouse? 6th Street, what year are we talking about? 
now? Um, I, I don't think now because it's uh, past tense. Lineman still owns it. Then it used to be uh, somebody else. Lineman has now called it Serenity. But when I used to work down there, that was Lineman's funeral home. And that was around uh, 6th and Washington, maybe. It's still there. But it, now it's called Serenity. I have, let me see where Lineman, Middendorf. Now, Middendorf, uh, I think they closed that one on Main Street down. I've driven by there and there's no sign, there's no activity. So that old Middendorf on, you know, Main Strass up in there, I think it's closed. But I've been in there many times and that had been in service since the late 1800s. Let me see what I have here. I have uh, Willen and Hugenberg, 50 West 6th. Is that it? It sounds right to me. That would be Willen and Hugenberg. I think that's correct. 46, 48, and 50 West 6th Street. I think that's right. Yep. And, and yeah, Mary E. Smith Cemetery is correct. That's it. It's, it, it is in Ellesmere, you're right, not Orlando. Yep, yeah, and uh, he, he's a, or they're agreeing with you that it was, uh, they think it was Hugenberg. Yeah, I think that's right. Lineman bought it and they operated it while I was working down. But, uh, you know, Willen and Hugenberg has probably been gone for quite some time. But it, it's still operating as a funeral home today. Glenmeyer was another one. Uh, I don't remember where Glenn Meyer's place was, but it very well could have been the same place. Glenn Meyer is another name from 1900. He's been around at least that long. Gone now, but I think that's all part of Lineman's business now. Okay, and uh, Joetta is saying there are many unmarked graves of enslaved people in small family cemeteries throughout rural areas. This is true in other states as well, so. I have one in this neighborhood where I'm living. Oh, an example of this is Dinsmore. Oh, yeah. yeah, certainly. Dinsmore would be one, yeah. Yep, in Boone County. There's been a couple unearthed recently for airport expansion, unfortunately. And Mount Zion's expansion also. But I have one still here in my subdivision off Pleasant Valley. It's still here. Very cool. Okay, well, I think that that's, uh, that wraps up the questions. So, uh, Sean, do you wanna? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I do this. So, bear with me, let's open the screen. Oh, that uh, Middendorf, that, that's uh, their nephew. Okay. Oh yeah, so Paul says Middendorf sold the business on Main Street then later, family members started it up again in Fort Wright on 17. No, that's no. They were operating simultaneously. Okay. The, uh, John moved down there, and um, they sold the name, but I don't think the Middendorf's. Even though it operated under Middendorf, it no longer had one in the business. So the only real Middendorf left in business is next to Waltz down on 3L. Do we have any more questions for tonight? Nope. Um, no, just thank you, Travis. Uh, many people are expressing their um, gratitude for such an interesting program. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it was it was great. And thank you for your time. Um, before we sign off, I want to let everybody know about some upcoming events at BCM. You know, join us uh, tomorrow night for the last concert of our season featuring Blue 80. Our doors open at 6 and we'll start rocking to the 80s from seven until 9 p.m. Uh, make sure you uh, stop by and try some of W's favorite barbecue, the food truck, Doolittle's Snacks and Shacks, they've been great. Um, next up is Silent Art Fitting for Silent Art pieces have started. You can actually come in the museum and see them hanging up or you can bid on some of the silent art online. 
Our fresh art party and live auction starts on Sunday, September 11th. And you can check on bcmuseum.org for more information on that. Saturday, September 24th, BCM hosts a car show and museum cruise in. We'll have food, music, classic cars on display from 11 to 2. So we hope to see you there. And finally, make sure that you check out our next history hour. It'll be with Brian McIntyre and It'll be on the history of Camp Ernst. That'll be September 7th. Thanks again to all the sponsors and our supporters. I'd like to thank the staff, trustees, members of Beringer Crawford Museum, and Travis and Angela Mendel for helping us out for this night. It's been uh, fun. I would say for more information, if you want to learn more about uh, Northern Kentucky history throughout the week, visit us online where you can find the latest curators chats with our curator collections, Jason French. Like us on uh, Facebook, subscribe and share and take care everybody. Thanks. Thanks for having a great night. Thank you.